It's good to go. Um, so, uh, just to announce upcoming events uh, on August the 30th, uh, which will be here, that's on a Tuesday. Uh, Jody Skipper will be uh, talking about reading from uh, signing copies of Behind the Big House. And on September the 1st, uh, Thacker Mountain will be Sign at the Powerhouse. Is that okay? And Matt Bondurant. Uh, we'll be there with his book, A Lander City. But today we're here with Beverly Lowry, the author of six novels and uh, five books of nonfiction. She was born in Memphis, uh, raised in Greenville, went to college here all four years? No. Two years. Two years and then. Okay, there it is. Uh, I, I graduated from Memphis State. Okay. Um, and she's lived, uh, raised in Greenville, uh, but, and has lived uh, most of her life in Texas, I would say, most of your life there. Sort of. Sort of. Some in New York. Some in New York, some in D.C., little in Los Angeles, a little in Missoula, Montana. Okay, that's right. Been around. Okay. Buffalo, New York. Um, her uh, third and fifth novels, Daddy's Girl, which came out in 1981, and Breaking Gentle are set in Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, her first two novels, Come Back Lolly Ray, which came out in 1977, and Emma Blue, a year later, uh, as, as well as her last novel, the Track of Real Desires, which came out in 1994, are set in Unola, Mississippi, uh, her fictional Greenville, I right. would say. Uh, right. uh, others do. Well, I out that in this book, the new book says, obviously, Greenville. Right. And anybody who's from there knows that it may be called Unola, but it's Greenville, and it's me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And... Um, Another novel, uh, The Perfect Sonia, which came out in 1987, uh, is a story of an actress, um, acting being an element of Beverly's own experience, uh, um, and occurs, that book takes place in both New York and Texas. Um, crossed Over, a murder, a memoir, published in 1992, and her 1st uh, nonfiction book is an account of, the, of uh, Carla Fay Tucker, uh, who's still on death row? Is she still alive? No. She, she, she was executed in oh, she, okay. 1998. Okay, okay. Executed in 1998 um, uh, for killing her boyfriend with a pickaxe. Uh, you guys remember that can, that can always happen. Uh, <laughs> Actually, can I correct yes. that? Yeah, he wasn't her boyfriend. <laughs> He was somebody who um, she felt like owed her or something. She had a grudge against him. And what you left out is there was also a young woman asleep with him. She also received uh, some hits from the pickaxe. Okay, that's lesson number two. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in 2003 and 2007, uh, Beverly wrote two outstanding biographies of black women. Her Dream of Dreams, a biography of Madam C.J. Walker, who was born in 1867 and who uh, may or may not be, by virtue of her cosmetics empire, the first uh, black American uh, millionaire. And Harriet Tubman. Uh, imagining a life who, as we know, is most famous as the abolitionist who freed close to 100 slaves from Maryland by virtue of uh, a number of escapes uh, uh, via the Underground Railroad. And another murder tale in 2016, Who Killed Those Girls, Who Killed These Girls, rather, an account of the quadruple slaying of young girls working 
in an Austin, Texas yogurt shop. And now, today, we have uh, Deer Creek Drive, A Reckoning of Memory and Murder in the Mississippi Delta, which is a um, complex, uh, mysterious in many ways, and very compelling account of a matricide uh, that takes place in 1948 in Leland, Mississippi, which m most of you here know is quite close to Greenville, uh, and which in that part of the world has become something of a, that event has become something of a, of a fable. Uh, and everyone uh, today has their own ideas about that murder, I would say. Right, I would say. Um, uh, in addition to these books, uh, Beverly is published in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Vanity Fair, Granta, Rolling Stone. She lives in Austin today. And I'm very happy to say that I believe she visits us every time she has a book. Y'all please welcome Beverly Lowry. Um, so, I want to get back to uh, Deer Creek Drive uh, right away, but I have a couple of questions first. Okay. Um, how is it that you came to write two biographies of black women, uh, one quite well known and the other not so much? Um, I was asked to write both. Huh. Yeah, and so the first was Madam C.J. Walker, and a woman who had been um, the partner um, of a black man who owned this, uh, Alex Haley, had wanted to write the biography of Madam C.J. Walker. He died, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. she was looking for someone to write it. And she came to me, uh, having read some of my other stuff. I, you know, I can't exactly explain why, but having read things about the South, with, which always deals with race, and um, she, then I discovered that what she had in mind was fiction. And once I read about Madam Walker and began a, working, you know, just sort of working around the edges, I decided that this woman needed a full accounting of her life without fictionalization. And I'm, I'm very grateful that I was asked to do it and did it because, um, the fiction came first, as you just said, and um, I learned to do archival research uh, writing that book. I really didn't know how. I had been, been schooled in it, um, and it's just- Excuse me, is this pre-internet? Is this Pre-internet, <laughs> yes. Yes, this was going to the library and dealing with special collections and the people who are um, guardians of special collections, who you know have you you have to be very respectful to. Um, so it it just was. And my first question was, uh, Madam Walker's parents had been slaves. She was born after um, the um, freedom, but her parents had been slaves. So how do you find people? How do you find anything about? people who were uh, treated as property. And it became quickly um, apparent to me, you had to know who the enslaver was and look them up and then in tax rolls, they listed property. And slave, if- Slave schedules. And slave schedules. And um, it just, it all was like, opening a new world to me, to, to learn history and learn um, uh, how, to, how to do something new at that point in my life. Um, and then Tubman was uh, an, an editor at Doubleday who had read the proposal for the Madam Walker book and she, she liked it. And she asked me if I would write. Her dream was um, to publish a book about Harriet Tubman, who had been her hero. And she was also black. Uh huh. And up, up, up to that point, what other Tubman biographies? 
Uh, not many when I started. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was an original one that was published in the 19th century. But uh, since then, uh, the, and people stayed away from writing books because Harry Tubman couldn't read or write, and so everything was according to somebody else. And it was almost always a white person saying, this is how she looked, this is what she talked like. So um, it, you know, it had to be done carefully so as to, to really try to find out who she was and, and what she did. It, it was a wonderful thing. But by the time my book came, came out, because I'm a little slower than other people, two other books have been published. Mm -hmm. um, the focus of your writing, as you alluded to just a moment ago, travel from fiction to uh, biography and true crime. Uh, why? <laughs> well, the true crime, um, and by the way, I, I really do not like to label myself anything, and, and, and certainly not a true crime writer. And I, I think I'm not alone in that. Writers don't like to be categorized and, and sort of put in a certain... I'm sorry. <laughs> You're forgiven because I love you. But don't do it again. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, but I wrote the book about Carla Faye Tucker because I was fascinated with her. Um, I'd had something terrible happen in my life. My son was killed in a hit and run incident. And I don't mean to get personal here, but I wouldn't have written that book otherwise because um, I was sort of not able to write fiction. And I saw her picture in the paper, a certain picture, and I was carried away. All the books I've written, the three books I've written that have to do with terrible, Murders, not just murder, but really um, uh, ghoulish, grim, and um, terribly terrible to read about murders, uh, have come about from other reasons than saying, I'm going to write about this one, I want to write about that one, you know, how, how these people kill other people. Uh, they came about because of something personal, a personal attraction to the people, to the story. Uh, and the uh, writing and the really the decision to write the book came later, after this. And I, in some ways, fell in love with Carla's story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, wrote her, and she was on death row. And I said, can I come see you? And she wrote back and said, sure, I've got nothing but time. <laughs> so... <laughs> I, I, that was a start, and it, it, it turned into a book. Okay, Deer Creek Drive. Okay. 1948. Mm-hmm. What happened? Okay, <laughs> to begin with, I, it's a good thing I've never tried to hide my age or pretend I was younger than I am, because if I was 10 years old in 1948, the story is out, right? And, <laughs> you know, it's, it's over. And it, chance at saying, oh, I'm not quite 80 yet, of course not, um, but uh, a murder occurred in the next town, town, as Richard said, nine miles from Greenville, where I lived, that shocked the, uh, both those towns and pretty much the Delta, at least the close Delta, Indianola and Rosedale and all the towns that were close to us. Uh, a woman who was defined or named in every newspaper story, and there were many, many from across the country, she was called a society matron, uh, was viciously murdered with um, pruning shears in her home, and she lived on Deer Creek Drive. I don't know how many know that street in Leland, but I was told pretty quickly when I started talking to people that it said that if you want to go to heaven, you got to live on De Deer Creek Drive. So it was, and it is, the best street in town. 
and um, the only person there to tell the story of what happened was um, the dead woman, Idella Thompson's daughter, Ruth Dickens, who was, uh, Idella was 67 and Ruth was 43. So the whole thing was um, outrageous and outlandish and, uh, you know, it, I'm careful about saying unimaginable because that's what writing is, is imagining. And so I guess it wasn't completely unimaginable, unimaginable, but it was certainly unthinkable. It was, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty amazing. And um, uh, apparently uh, she tried to blame it on a black person. A black person was supposedly seen. Nothing ever comes of that. Um, right. Uh, and eventually, uh, it, it was this was the expected thing, right? You know that right. she would that she would blame a black man. Um, um, she said a Negro did it, right. and um, it was not unexpected among white or black people that that would be said. Yeah, and I was surprised and uh, sort of happy that it apparently. The community, nobody ever really kind of bought into that. It didn't take long. I mean, I, I talked mm -hmm. to a woman who was a child at that time, and um, she lived on Deer Creek Drive, and they, after, they were getting together a posse to go into the black community to find somebody who might match the description they had received and might be, have, blood, you know, on his clothes, or, and uh, they then rounded up the women and girls who lived on Deer Creek Drive, because there was this maniac loose, and this person uh, who I talked to was one of the girls who was rounded up and taken to Stoneville, and her father was in the posse, which rode the horseback and was armed, and then what she remembered is they came and got all the, the females, took them back home, and she heard her father say, there is no Negro. It was somebody in the family. So that quickly, it, you know, became questioned. It didn't mean it was over, uh, but it did mean that immediately, when you hear that story, like that night, somebody who lived across Deer Creek on the other side, the better side of Deer Creek, uh, felt like this was, this was not as it had been reported by the only person who was there. And, and once the thing gets to uh, court, um, the, the whole judicial process there seemed bizarre uh, and kind of uh, uh, failed. Can you, can you kind of step through that a little bit? Well, um, the daughter was indicted and um, arrested, indicted, and tried, and uh, convicted, which was uh, also another shock. And it, the trial, in a lot of ways, and the conviction was the most surprising part to the community because she was a respected white lady who taught Sunday school and um, was well known in the community and this was not supposed to happen. But um, uh, it did. And then when they started the voir dire to choose the jury, uh, uh, the law had been passed uh, that black people could not be excluded from juries. <coughs> Uh, this didn't <laughs> include women of any color because women did not serve. I don't, all of you may know about this. This shocked me. Women could not serve on juries in the state of Mississippi until 1968. Last state in the country to allow women on juries. Um, black men could serve on juries. 
but uh, there were two men who were on the in the jury pool, and they in no way wanted to be on a jury of um, a, try try a white woman who was disrespected, and so they both said. Um, one said he, the death penalty was a possibility. He said he could not vote for the death penalty. And the other one said something like that. They got off the jury. They were business, one was a businessman, one was a teacher, and they were qualified. Um, so the, the men who were on the jury were um, businessmen and farmers, and a lot of them worked for the Gypsum Company, um, you know, a jury of her peers, I, I don't really know if you could say that, I don't think so, <laughs> you know, but that was the jury she got. Um, Ruth was kind of an outlier when it came to dress and appearance. She didn't dress up for her trial. Um, she wore her usual kind of golf dresses and clunky shoes and um, no jewelry, no hat, no gloves. Uh, and this was cited in newspaper reports that you know she came in hatless. And she had um, a haircut, that her hair was very dark, almost black. And it, she wore it in a kind of soft pompadour over the ears and cropped at the neck, blunt. And, it was in every newspaper that covered this trial it's called a mannish bob, which, you know, you can draw, you know, know how that reverberates out and what, why they said that. So, you know, it, the jury had um, little reason to convict her of first degree murder. And, uh, every reason to want to do that, I think. And, and I, don't, I don't want to give away too much. Right, I'm, I, you know, <laughs> I'm glad a lot, so you No, just, no, you're, do, you're doing great, I, but, no, I, but I, I don't I, want to lead you to uh, <laughs> places that I think the reader ought to go to himself or herself. Right. It's a really fascinating book with uh, a, a lot of things that you don't expect. Uh, uh, occur. Uh, so maybe I'll let the audience ask questions. And if y'all have any questions, we'd be interested in taking notes. I, one last thing I would say, when I started writing this book, as I say, I'm uh, sort of pulled into it. This book um, uh, was really important to me. And somebody asked me for an interview, said, why did you write it? And I said, really, that's not the question. The question is, why did I wait so long? Because it has, the, the event has hung in my heart and mind since it occurred when I was 10 years old and then 11 when the trial took place. It, it changed my sense of what was possible, how far human beings could go, uh, uh, how far, uh, how deep, um, a dark event could go, um, and so, and when I'm asked, when I was asked uh, uh, relating to the other two books, why I write about these terrible crimes, I always cited this one because that was the one that made me think about things like this. Um, I, but this book, I also want. Book goes from 1948, Jim Crow to pass the Brown decision and uh, the response to the Brown decision in the Mississippi Delta, which um, I think was um, vital, uh, vitally important to ha what's happened in the Delta now. Um, and I wanted to be that about that era and my life in Greenville as somebody who wasn't a you know, society person or from a prominent family and pull that all together and kind of wind those strands together. Hopefully that's what <laughs> I did do um, and that's why I still complain when people say true crime. So. <laughs> <laughs> Who got it? <laughs> right, well there is that. So any questions? 
were you able to delve into the relationship between the mother and daughter? Uh, to some extent. Did, did you all hear? Yeah, okay. Um, to some extent, because um, while, you know, a lot of people are gone, <laughs> have died since then, um, a lot of people had stories and, and knew it, Ruth. And I've talked to a few people who, you know, were fairly up there in years who had known Mrs. Thompson. And uh, both women were described, my, one of my favorite quotes from anybody I talked to was somebody I know in Greenville asked her mother, who had known Mrs. Thompson, and she knew Ruth, but she mostly knew Mrs. Thompson. And she said, Miss Thompson could be right difficult. <laughs> and I thought that was a Southern lady's version of saying she was a bitch. <laughs> and a uh, lot of stories about Ruth and her um, kind of pushy nature and some difficulties between the two, but uh, of course, the defense said they had a perfect relationship, so you had to kind of deal with um, what the, the truth was. Um, and But most of it was from stories people told, but not the family, because the family, you know, was a, families want their kin person to get off. So I had to go past that and ask some other people. And, I, you know, there were a lot of people in Leland who refused to talk to me, they didn't want their story out, a whole lot of people. Um, and then there were others who were willing to steer me in the direction of talking to other people and uh, help me write the story. So I, I got both, and I got some real harsh words from a couple of people about well, who did I think I was, and I'm not from there, and why am I writing this book? So. Mm -hmm. Beverly, a lot of your research on this book uh, was not done on the internet either, was it? Oh, I know. I did. Uh, the, you know, the internet research was really tied to COVID because I had done a lot of interviewing, I traveled to Greenville many times and gone, the Mississippi Department of Archives and History was really seriously useful to me. Katie Blunt, the director, is fabulous and she allowed me to search through an evidence box that the archivist downstairs said he didn't think he could let me look at uh, because there was little envelopes full of um, not body parts, but hair and fingernails and things like that. And they were, they allowed me to do that. So I did all kinds of research, you know. But when it came down to being locked in for uh, COVID, I had done most of the ground research and the archival research. I had the trial transcripts. I don't know if any of you have ever read trial transcripts, but they are infinitely useful. And uh, they're very long if it's a capital murder case. And I had had those to deal with, and the appeal is online to deal with. And so then I stayed home and uh, depended a lot on newspapers.com, Delta Democrat Times, and a lot of other Southern newspapers are on it. But did a lot of footwork. Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> and whether or not I have them at the same time. <laughs> were they this, the kind on the front of the book? Yes. And, yes. And it was a, it was a stabbing, she went clipping her She's throat. Obsessed. Okay, here's the thing. No, no, this is the kind of thing I get involved in. So they were called in newspapers, uh, garden shears, rose shears, printing shears, and hedge clippers. And when I was 10 years old, I envisioned hedge clippers. Yeah. And of course, you know, yeah. the handles are this long. Yeah, and they are sit like scissors. 
So, I mean, okay, this is for you, Lisa, okay? <laughs> Everybody else may you know, put your fingers in your ears if you want to hear this. To kill somebody with hedge clippers, and the coroner estimated 150 pecks, they call it, in her body. It would be very hard to stab somebody 150 times with hedge clippers because you'd have to close them and go up and stab. And it would probably take only one or two to put somebody under. If you've got shears like the, and these are apparently the shears. I mean, they, uh, this comes from a magazine story about the, the trial. First of all, they're short. Second of all, they're curved. And so one of the sheriff's men said, she was pecked all over. And I think that's what you would do, because you have to be close, and you wouldn't get very deep because they're curved. So you peck, 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 peck. Now, the one in her skull went all the way to her brain, so that one managed to go further. But I can't tell you how many people in Greenville who know a lot about this said to me, I thought they were hedge clippers. Um, and so it, I actually, during the writing, took a pair, I mean, I have printing shears, and, and I have hedge clippers, and I brought them in, sat them down by my table, and by my computer, and measured them, you know, and looked at them and thought about this, as opposed to this, that's what you do with printing shears, right? And this, as opposed to this. And, you know, it made sense to me that she had that many uh, cuts. Where are uh, those things? Excuse me? Where is the murder weapon now? I don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, there was only uh, the uh, transcripts. The, the trial went on appeal. And uh, when the appeal was done, and so the, the version of the transcripts I have came from the archives, the state archives. And they have what went to the, um, the state Supreme Court for appeal. And um, so the final arguments, regrettably, aren't there because they don't have anything to do with the appeal of the decision. Um, and I went to the Washington County Courthouse several times, and they, they said, it's not here, there's nothing here. And, if it's there and nobody just wants to go look for it. I mean, to, to a lot of people, 1948 is like, could be 1848, you know. So um, I don't know, but the, I was really, really grateful that the archives had it, you know, for me to go through, it, you know, it's five or 600 pages and people get up on the witness stand and you hear, where were you at 12.05? Where were you at 12.08? I mean, it gives you a detailed account of people's behavior. Mm -hmm. So Beverly, when I was growing up in Leland as a little boy, I had I'd heard this story a few times, but not that often. It really wasn't that often mm -hmm. not for anybody. And I had always pictured this maniacal young woman killing her mother um, and just thought, you know, she had just lost it. And, and my question is, did your understanding of who she was or your, your sympathy for this murderess uh, change as you wrote the book? When you were a kid, you knew who she was and you had an idea of who she was, but as you did your research, did that change? Yes, yes. As a kid, I mean, we all, uh, everybody was scared of her, you know, and I heard, uh, I was at Jackson at the festival, book festival, and I was in Greenville, and uh, people, a lot of people were in, who came to have their books on talked about exactly what you just talked about and being terrified because she was the boogeyman, you know, and rumors flew about how the murder was committed and other things Ruth might have done, and it, it, uh, so a fair trial was actually pretty impossible for her to have uh, because there was so much talk about what had happened. 
And then people get into, well, you know, she was never a nice person, or, you know, she was this or that. Um, and so it changed completely, and I, it's very hard to say, aside from perhaps killing her mother. She was a truly interesting and very smart person, you know, and I, I said this in the book that I know you know a writer's not supposed to, you know, feel close to her subject, but uh, I, I really, I liked her a lot. I thought she, she was funny and um, she just was interesting. She didn't dress the way she was supposed to as a lady. I mean, Lizzie Borden got off because she dressed like a lady and uh, the inductive reasoning that freed her was a lady like that could not have done such a thing. Therefore, she didn't. And Ruth, the, in all the petitions to get her out of prison, they said, you know, she taught Sunday school, she could not have done something like this. But she didn't prove it, you know, by pandering to what people expected a woman to be like. And I, I just quite admired her for that. And I was, uh, I did wonder about her lawyers, because you know, I know a lot of lawyers not insisting that she at least, um, you know, wear a nice dress or different shoes. You know? um, but I, I changed completely from then till now. But you know what happens, you learn about people when you write about them, you should. Yes. What's next? What are you working on or think about working on? Uh, well, I'm thinking about working on something, but I'm not working on yet. Um, <laughs> I, I have the feeling, uh, I mean, Richard told you where all my books are based. Um, I don't feel like I'm gonna be leaving the Delta. You know, I feel like it, it has in, this book is called A Reckoning, and um, I did not come up with the word, that word, uh, but once the, it was the young assistant of my editor who actually came up with it, and I thought, this is a reckoning, because it's a reckoning of my life in Greenville, and making peace with what happened all those years ago, and uh, what I see now in Greenville, which is quite disturbing to see how Greenville has declined. Um, and so um, there's, there's too much still there and too much, but I've gotten to a point now where I'm easy with it. <laughs> you know, I'm easy with the town, I'm easy with the place, I'm easy with, almost easy with my history there, almost, you know, but that takes longer. <laughs> You did mention uh, being in prison, so let's just go there for a little while. Okay. Um, how, how did she manage to get this sort of treatment, apart from being a, a white woman, that she did when she was in prison? You know, one reason I say she was smart, she did extremely well in prison. The white women, and the, the most, the, the highest number of white women who were ever in parchment at that time was seven. And uh, the white women lived in a cottage. They had, there were two apartments, they had a flower garden, and they could sit outside when they finished their work. The black women lived in barracks like the men, you know, in, in double-decker beds and, and such. Uh, white and black women worked together in the sewing room, so they did work together. But Ruth, um, one way to, I found out about Ruth in prison was sometimes um, legislators uh, would go through inspecting the prison and it was how the warden got his budget taken care of is uh, by their approval. And they would talk to her. And uh, if they asked about the murder, she would say no comment. But she never complained and um, she said she was well treated. There were no vermin, she said, and the, the, uh, there was a breeze, and she knew how to adjust. And what I know from the other people I've talked about 
uh, who talked to who've been in prison is you have to adjust and readjust and readjust, you know, because one time when I went to see Carla Fay, for instance, they handcuffed her before they brought her to the visitor's room. And from where she was to the visitor's room was not as far as from here to the street. And as they put the bracelets on her, she shrugged, I could see her. She shrugged and said, my favorite jewelry. Um, and she, that was her way of dealing with where she was and saying, you know, this won't last forever. <laughs> And I think Ruth had that same capacity. That's why the, there are rumors that Ruth could wear her own clothes. She didn't wear a prison dress. No proof, but people thought that. People have said she, you know, she had her own crystal and her own china. I don't believe that either. Um, and I don't think the warden would have allowed it. He said she had gotten her prison dress as soon as she was admitted. Plus, I, you know, Ruth was college ed educated. She went to Holland. She studied Latin. Uh, she said, had far more education than anybody in her cottage. Whoever came and went, she still had more education. She was smart. She would, had a good sense of humor. Um, and uh, one of the defense attorneys visited parts of the time and thought, I'll go by and see Ruth. And no, it's a prosecutor. And he went by and said, How are you doing, Ruth? How's it going? She said, Oh, I'm just convicting around. <laughs> and I thought, this woman knows how to handle herself and how to handle a difficult situation to say the least. Plus she had a great sense of humor, which I also admired a lot in her. Um, I think she did amazingly well, and when people come up with these um, stories, uh, I, I just don't think she wanted the other, she wanted to get along with the other people. She mostly hung, it seemed like, from the interviews, the people who, the women who had committed white collar crimes, embezzlement. There was one more woman in the white women's cottage with her who was in for first degree murder. Uh, and they don't seem to have been friendly, which I totally understand. Well, uh, yes, Anne? Did you try to find any women who were in the prison with her? I did, I did. And I did, I never found anybody. There was a couple I really w would like to have found. Um, and, but I did talk to some people who worked in Parchment at that time, and uh, a number of people who worked there, and people who had been in the women's, white women's quarters. And um, I had an interesting conversation with a woman. She and her, her husband had gotten out of Ole Miss, and there were no jobs. And um, so they got a job in the office at Parchment, I mean, and, and she said, I couldn't find the uh, entry papers of Ruth going into prison. They had a book, that, and it was descriptions. I was curious how they would physically describe her, so that if she escaped, they'd have a description of, you know, how, how tall, color skin, and all. Uh, and they do not, I've had people go to the archives, go through the, I mean, because the uh, records are there in microfilm, and they simply aren't there. But this young woman told me her father had been in Parchman. And when they moved the records out of the prison into the archives in various places, she was, she went through them and looked for her father's record. And it said something about that he had assaulted her, his daughter. And she thought it sounded like rape. I mean, because assault is sometimes used that way. And so she, I said, so what'd you do? She said, I just took them out, threw them away. So I thought, okay, maybe that's why Ruth's records on there. People could just do that, you know, if they really wanted or knew somebody and said, take her out, you know, especially after she was at home. 
Um, so I found out about life in prison in Parchman, um, but I never did find any of the other inmates. I found out many of them were no longer alive. <laughs> well, we'll uh, uh, call it call it an evening here, and um, thank you for doing this here today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I um, always love to come here. And, uh, There's, we, we barely scratch the surface of what's in this book, so hope you find it interesting. And she's going to sign books now. Yep, sure. All right.